Yeah, it sounds smoother. You look um, like I don't know uh, how to get back a to Minecraft a, character a right now, but I can hear you. <laughs> All right, maybe that'll be better. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so we're a little little jet lagged out here, you know, getting pretty tired. It's I mean, it's only like nine thirty at night, but you know, uh, huge time difference, talking like twelve hours. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a tough adjustment, but I'm sleeping every night and I'm getting sleep and getting rest, so I, you know I feel good, but. I definitely get tired a little sooner uh, rather than later, but out here I'll be fighting uh, early in the morning, so that won't be a problem. You know? Right? Yeah. Um, where are you training nowadays? Like, what time zone are you normally living under? Still, still in. Um... Uh, normally Central. Mm -hmm. We're in Austin, Texas now, so I'm in okay. Central time zone. Yeah, because you were out in New Jersey, right? Yeah, I was living in New Jersey and commuting to New York every day uh, to train uh, at uh, Henzo Gracie in New York with yeah. uh, John. How long have you been in Austin? Did you move it uh, in the same time that uh, Gordon Ryan moved out there? Yes. Yeah, we, we the team moved to Puerto Rico first. Then the uh, split happened and everything, and everybody uh, went to Austin and went their separate ways in Austin. Mm, okay. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, big time difference here. Did you, were you able to get to uh, Bangkok like ahead of time to kind of acclimate or did you recently get there? Uh, I did. Okay. I got in on Monday, like Monday morning, you know, it's just a little bit of time uh, out here. I'll be fighting Saturday, you know, it'll air in the States Friday night, but Saturday morning for me. So, you know, it's a decent amount of time. I, I probably could have got here a little bit sooner, but it, it's good enough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because um, usually like fighters try to acclimate to the time zone because they're usually fighting at night, you know, local time. But in this case, you're fighting in the morning. So is it almost like you don't want to get there too early because you are fighting in the morning, like at normal hours? That would be, you know, state state wise. I wouldn't necessarily say that for sure. I mean, you know, I'd rather <laughs> adjusting to the adjusting to my training schedule is usually what's most relevant for that. You know, I try to like. Basically, like I'll just adjust my training schedule so that I'm training in the morning now instead of, uh, you know, at nighttime. But I hear what you're saying, you know, like for most of the time for fighting previous to this, every time we f I fought in Asia, I was uh, I was fighting pretty late at night, the same way that you would for, uh, you know, any organization. So um, I would I would train myself actually to be awake a lot later. You know, I'd, I'd stay up till three in the morning or so just so that like. I wasn't getting, you know, falling asleep around the time that I would be fighting. You know, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I like the time that I'm fighting, I think, for this fight uh, because it's like probably going to, I would guess it's going to be like 11 a.m. out here. Uh, and that's not too bad. You know, the last fight was like super early. I think it was like at 8 a.m. Um, it's kind of tough to just literally wake up and get punched in the face <laughs> with four ounce gloves. You know, yeah, get that's, some a, coffee that's a rough and some punches in there, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is your second fight of 2023. Um, you know, you're, you, I know you've been competing in several sports, right? You go back and forth with grappling and whatnot, uh, but it seems like you're getting some activity here on the MMA side. Is Was that a goal of yours or just that's how kind of things played out? Yeah. I, ever since I started MMA, I wanted that to be the main focus. I, uh, I had, uh, uh, some time after, so I had, I had some time after my, uh, first loss uh where i wasn't going to be able to do you know to fight for a little bit because of the concussion so mm -hmm. um you know i decided to take a grappling match next um and then i you know focus on adcc and stuff so it may it just seemed to make sense at the time you know uh but now you know we're back on track with mixed martial arts and uh you know i, I i'm a competitor so i love to compete but it's not a uh, you know, MMA is definitely, definitely what I'm most focused on. And, um, you know, if grappling, something important pops up and I think it makes sense and I think it's going to be a big deal, um, you know, and it, it gets me up in the morning, then, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. But for the most part, you know, the main focus is, you know, being as successful as possible in mixed martial arts at this point. And talking about that first defeat, first professional defeat, first title fight as well. I know it was a quick fight, but um, what did you take out of it? What were sort of the takeaways from it? I know you, you you're very meticulous and, and articulate, uh, human being. So like, did you look back and, and, and take anything away from it that you're using now moving ahead in, in your career? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think that, that looking at, looking back at that moment, the most relevant thing to take, take away for me is that if I'm going to be attacking some number one, I don't necessarily think that, uh, I'm going to spend I'm going to
prioritize uh, the idea of like grabbing a hold of a leg and falling back to attack it uh, as like a preliminary strategy as often, just because it does carry some risk, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I have won fights very quickly in the past like that. And I've seen other athletes, you know, Rusama Parharis used to do it all the time. Um, there's other athletes that have done it uh, as well. But I, I think I have a lot of other skills um, that would make winning a fight much safer, you know, than doing that. Um, so it's good to have in my tool belt. It's not something I'm never going to use again. But I think that's one thing. And then the second thing to take away, because that wasn't the game plan for that fight anyway. I just, it just felt like a good idea. I had a hold of his leg and, you know, I've all worked out in the past, so. You know, it's the first time I ever really had a problem with it. Um, but the other thing that, to take away is while I'm I, I'm participating in that, like the idea of trying to attack somebody's leg from bottom position, there's a few, diff- few different conditions that need to be met if I'm going to be doing that relatively safely. And uh, those conditions were not met, uh, you know, when I got knocked out. Uh, what needs to happen, in my, in my opinion, is the opponent needs to be down on a knee. So I either need to break you down to a knee, I need to break you down to your butt, or I have to have you turning away from me. You have to be facing away from me. And if I can't do one of those three things, you're standing above me on two feet and you're bo- you have both uh, knees to the ground, right? That's a, that's a position of, of power there where you could do a lot of damage. And to just to not be focused on getting up and off balancing you and to be focused on trying to submit somebody at that point in time, I think is a mistake. So I, I think that's where I, I faltered, uh, if you ask me there. So I, I learned a lot from that fight for sure. And uh, an opportunity here to be on a two-fight win streak since that defeat. Is the goal still the belt? You know, get back to a championship fight and, and become champion under one? Yeah, of course, man. You know, I definitely want to be uh, I definitely want to be a featherweight champion at one championship. I mean, I've always had my eyes, you know, set even further than that. You know, I, I came into this organization watching Martin Nguyen, who was a two-time champion, you know, two-division champion, I should say, and... Uh, You know, I want that fight, but I also would love to do the same thing that, uh, you know, that he was able to do um, and, and be able to. I know I'm getting ahead of myself here because we haven't won, <laughs> won this championship yet, but that's what I would love to do. You know, I have, my, I have a high ambition, you know, for, for my career and, and my abilities and everything like that. So, yeah, for sure. The, uh, the featherweight title has to come first. And there's a lot of really tough guys in the featherweight division that need to be beaten as well before I even really think about uh, conquering, you know, multiple divisions or anything like that. It's like, man, there's a lot of really tough guys out there. Yeah. That's current title holder, 10 ties, incredible. Don Lee, I have to have a, a rematch against, obviously. Like I said, Martin Nguyen, I, I look at him as the absolute best cream of the crop in the division, uh, even if he's not currently holding the title. You know, um, there's another uh, guy, Ilya, I can't remember the la- last name, um, but he's an incredible, uh, you know, striker. And uh, he looks very, very dangerous. I'm sure I'm going to have to fight him at some point uh, as well. You know, there's a lot of really, really dangerous, really tough opponents uh, that, you know, that need to be beaten. So the title is, is, is obviously like, uh, you know, from a standpoint of fans and, you know, the fame that's associated with it and the spectacle and all that kind of stuff is very important. But I guess like the most important thing to me is to beat the, the relevant guys that are the toughest you know, in the world in that division, you know. Yeah, of course. And and you're 31. You're still obviously very young and, and you know, in your prime, but you're no longer, you know, 23. Maybe w- that's around the time that uh, I remember no, actually older when I first started interviewing you. But um, have you thought about your your overall athletic career? Like, obviously, the belt is one goal, but have you thought about your longevity in it? How long you want to stick around in MMA? Um, I know you haven't taken a ton of damage and, and also sort of what you want the rest of your years to look like in fighting. Yeah. Yeah. I put a lot of thought into that. And I think that's really important for anybody to do, especially if they're considering fist fighting for a living. Um, you know, I think, <laughs> I think it's a real serious conversation that you have to have with your, your, yourself and with anybody, with your loved ones and all these sorts of things and, and your training partners, coaches, all these sorts of things. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, kind of willy nilly take fights and things. And I just really don't think it's a smart thing to do. I think if, If you're not going to take this very, very seriously, um, you know, it's a, it's a real dangerous sport to just participate in recreationally. Um, you know, it's not like jujitsu where you, you just tap and stuff. I mean, we're taking, you know, taking uh, brain damage potentially here. So, uh, yeah, I've thought about all those things. Um, I, you know, I want to try to be the best in the world at, at, at mixed martial arts for sure. My, at least, very least in my weight category, you know, um, but at, you know, when I look at my longevity and these sorts of things, it's based on um, how things work out, you know, like so far, like you said, you know, haven't taken a crazy ton of damage and you know, I didn't get knocked out in one fight, but 
Um, you know, it's not like I've had, you know, several fights in a row that have been brutal fights where I'm getting hit, you know, the entire fight and, and these sorts of things. If I have a bunch of fights like that, and I think like, you know, it, it's going to have a major effect on me as a person and, you know, uh, in my life and, and who I'm going to be, you know, when I'm older and all these sorts of things, it could absolutely play a role in whether or not I decided to retire, you know, sooner rather than later. You know, so it really depends. I like to believe that I'm, a, I'm an intelligent fighter who's going to be able to, you know, use his skills in a way that I, I can, you know, not get, uh, not take as much damage. And if I can do that well for the majority of my career, I can have a long fighting career. If I can't and I don't succeed in doing what I, you know, what I set out to do, uh, you know, I may have to call it off early. It's a really serious thing that we do, man, you know, and uh, I, I don't take it lightly and I, I don't take my, I don't take my brain lightly i don't take my body lightly i don't take any of these things lightly man you know we take big risks out there and and uh i i uh you know that's a part of it i get it but uh at the same time um i i also recognize that like there are other things that are important to me you know besides this yeah most definitely um and now back to this fight that you got on friday at one fight night 12 just looking here at the topology record of your opponent you know, right off the bat, just screams tough Russian dude, undefeated. He's got a Sambo gi right now on, on, on the on the profile. Give us the sort of scouting report on Shamil. Uh, what do you make of him? Where do you think he's most dangerous at? And where do you think you excel in this fight? Yeah, so it's funny because, like, you know, you, you get the narrative, right, of, like, the tough Russian wrestler, you know, Sambo, you know, all these sorts of things, right? I, when I hear, like, different grappling martial arts, like, I barely even, like, pay much attention now oh, this guy's a sambo whatever this guy jujitsu this guy wrestling it's like especially when we're coming talking about mixed martial arts I and mean, at the end of the day what we're all doing is using the techniques that that we feel are going to be best suited to help us win fights you know so um i i don't i i don't i look at it all as like submission wrestling you know uh, more than anything else I and mean, some people could argue and disagree and i guess it's fun to have our you know little conversations or whatever but you know, that somebody from that comes from a Sambo background isn't going to integrate techniques from other martial arts to make sure that they're winning fights. It's kind of crazy to me. Um, but the other thing I would say is that what's interesting about this, you know, quote unquote, you know, Russian rest. Uh, you know, kind of guy is that he wins his fights a little bit. Those other guys traditionally do. Uh, those other guys definitely use submissions. Don't get me wrong, but to me, what it seems like they they prioritize is control and damage on the ground. And I would argue that Shamil is actually far better at controlling and submitting people than he is controlling and damaging people on the ground. Certainly has some some dangerous uh, you know capabilities in terms of striking, especially on the feet. Like he's got a good overhand. He's got a a, a sneaky little uh, you know lead leg high kick that comes in sometimes. It, those can definitely do damage. I'm not discounting any of those. But when he's on the ground, it seems like priority is try to submit the guy, you know, and I think that's what he's going to try to do to me. I know that might seem crazy to some people, you know, looking out outside, looking in, uh, me being, uh, you know, the jiu-jitsu expert that I am. Um, but, man, that's the way that the guy wins fights. He's not changing the way that he wins fights, you know, just for this fight. It's not going to happen. You know, when shit hits the fan, when he gets hit hard or things get a little bit crazy, we, you know, we, we flurry into a clinch like – this guy's going to try to take me down and, and try to submit me. That's what he's been doing his whole career. So that's what, that's what things are going to look like. And as far as where he's strong, I mean, that's where he's strong, man. He's, he's, you know, he's obviously got a rest, uh, probably a, a better wrestling base than a traditional jujitsu guy would. Right. So, you know, that's going to be difficult, you know, getting up if I get taken down and taking him down is probably going to be a bit more difficult and all these things. But, you know, again, remember that, you know, this is mixed martial arts and this isn't a wrestling match. You know, a lot of people used to, uh, worry about George St. Pierre and his career. You know that I'm George St. Pierre. I'm certainly far from it at, the, at this point. Hopefully one day I can, you know, come Very close and be time, mentioned. Man. the same sentence. Right. But, uh, but, you know, people used to you criticize, you hear it in the commentary for all of George's fights. When anytime he fought a wrestler, you know, talking about how hard it was going to be, you know, to take him down, take whoever it was down. And, and he never failed to take any of these guys down. It's just mixed martial arts. Now, in his own right, I've trained with George many times in grappling, and and even in grappling, you, you know, he's got amazing takedowns in wrestling. You know, people just didn't realize it at the time. But I, I do believe that shoot boxing is very different than uh, you know just wrestling in the open when everybody's in a clinch. And uh, I think you got a much more fair shot even against a uh, you know Olympic level wrestler um, when we're talking about striking into takedowns. The posture is completely different. You know, you're much more upright. You're busy with other things. 
you're juggling a lot of balls where you're trying to defend. If, if this was a, if this was a pure, you know, grappling match, maybe it would be much more difficult to take him down, you know, and I'd have to do other things, but I think I'll be able to do it in a mixed martial arts context. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, yeah, and just uh, for the record, people might might forget about this, but you you were helping George St. Pierre in his return against Michael Bisping. In in an interview we did, you actually called the submission. You're like, "Yo, George is gonna submit uh, Bisping," and and you know that went on to happen. So so props to you. <laughs> um, but um, now speaking sort of outside of MMA, I do wanted to talk to you about sort of the grappling world because. Um, you know, when I first started interviewing you, you were not even in MMA yet. Like you were thinking about it, considering it. But at that time, you were uh, grappling. I remember. I think our first conversation was after your your your, your famous match against Kron Gracie um, in that run you had. Um, and since man, grappling has changed a ton, right? Like I remember, I used oh, to yeah. just be able to roll up at ADCC and film all this stuff, and like you know, throw it on my YouTube channel. Now they got like TV deals and this and that, and you know, the industry has, has grown a ton, right? Um, you've yeah. been there to like witness the whole thing. Has it been trippy now kind of seeing that, you know, before we used to see like all these jujitsu guys go to MMA because there wasn't really a ton of money to be made in jujitsu unless like you had your own academy now, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Like you can make good money, like doing some seminars, winning some competitions here and there. There's money to be made now in jujitsu. For sure. Yeah, man, I feel really blessed to be uh, to have participated in jiu-jitsu at the exact time that I did. I, I think I got a little bit of the best of both worlds um, in this in in a certain sense. Like, you know, uh, I didn't make the amount of money that people are able to make for grappling matches now. You know, for some of my most important fights, you know, some of my most important fights, you know, my most famous fights, I made less than. It's significantly less than what somebody who would walk onto the UFC for their first fight with no name would make. You know what I mean? Um, and it's not that way anymore. You know, the guys that are the best in the sport taking the biggest risks and against the toughest guys are, are, are able to make money like that, you know, at the very least in grappling, which is, which is great. But it was cool because when I say best of both worlds, it's like, I kind of got to pioneer this thing, you know, to some degree. It's like, it's like, uh, it wasn't pioneer in the sense like me starting jujitsu. Obviously, that's a different. That was a different uh, you know stage of the game. But I got to pioneer professional grappling, right? You know, I was the one of the person you know uh, people helping carry the sport uh, to that height and making this something that people would be interested in watching and find exciting enough to pay for and you know be able to believe that you might be able to actually build a business model off of this thing. And, uh, you know, I take great pride in that. And, uh, I also am happy that I made some money along the way, which was great, you know? Um, and if I had chosen to, I could have continued to do that and never did mixed martial arts if I wanted to. And, uh, you know, life would probably be a lot better, but, uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it would be a lot, a lot less punches anyway. Um, a lot less scary, I guess. But, um, but keeping yeah. it 100, like let's say like you didn't come in at the time that you did and you were coming into grappling now and there's money to be made. Would you would you have gone down the MMA road because it just seemed like for grapplers that was kind of like a no-brainer because of the money? But like now, if you don't want to get punched in the face, like you don't have to. If you're yeah, well, so – right, yeah. So when I, when I made my switch, it was already that way if you ask me, or like pretty close to being that way. So I had known that I was going to be able to make money, you know, doing what I was doing and teaching and, you know, doing instructionals and competing. I, I knew I could make a very good living doing that. Um, you know, uh, so I, I kind of already had that, you know, that choice. But what I will say is, is the culture of jujitsu today because of some of these things is a little different, you know, than the culture that I kind of came up with. It was almost like, the culture of jujitsu when I kind of started doing jujitsu, it was like a side by side. It was like, you know, we kind of, while I knew that jujitsu wasn't fighting, it was so, so very much associated with fighting. Yeah. You know, like the, we looked at, we looked at jujitsu and it's like, this is, this is the way that we're going to defend ourselves and, and the fight. And, and, uh, you know, we looked at the UFC and we saw the things that these guys are doing. And, you know, I, I don't know, it felt like, um, it felt much more closely related in a way. Um, so I, I do feel as though like some of the athletes today have a, are a little bit more of a jujitsu purist kind of mindset than like when I was coming up. Like I agree with what you said that, that 
for in my era, a lot of people switch to MMA for money, and that, that's that's happening less. But I also think that there's like just a certain a certain aspect of the rough and tumble idea of like a jujitsu guy being a being a fighter. Like I don't know, man. Like when my instructor decided, you know, when Tom the Blast, when the original instructor decided, like he was going to fight MMA, and he had sparring practices on on Sunday. He, he would do that because he needed to do his own sparring, you know what I mean? But he also needed to be at the gym. I mean, we all went, all right, I guess we spar now. <laughs> you know, so, so I got, I bought a pair of gloves and like, you know, I don't even think I have a mouthpiece most days. I was throwing paper towels in my mouth and I didn't know what I was doing, you know, back then. It, it wasn't like real experience. I just kind of, you know, swung my hands until I could take somebody down. Um, you know, but we just did it, you know, and I, I don't think that that's like happens today you know, in, in most grappling gyms, you know, you, it would be, it'd be a, sure some of the guys might do it, but everybody wouldn't be down. I think there's a lot of guys involved in competitive jujitsu that are not down to fight in any way, shape or form. Wouldn't be interested in it at all. Um, you know, uh, so the culture has changed a lot, but for me, me personally, I like to believe that who I am, I, I no matter what, I probably would have, uh, bridged the gap. I just looked at it. It was just something I always wanted to be able to do, man. I, like when I started doing jujitsu, it was about like being able to defend myself and stuff. And and mixed martial arts just seems like a, a, a even more advanced version of that, you know? Yeah, for so. sure. And, and I think part of what you mentioned, I think you're you're spot on with that. Um, I, I think part of that association of jujitsu and, and fighting, why it was so strong, was probably and and I don't mean to be disrespectful here. Again, I, I've trained and all that. But it was probably because jujitsu was like far, like there was no doubt it was like the do most dominant art, right? Within MMA, mm. right? Like it was it. Like we knew that jujitsu like reigned above all, right? Um, Hoyce Gracie proved that in sure. the early days of the tournament. And it's like you could kind of get by with like so so striking. You could kind of get by with so so wrestling, but like you need to know what's going on, on the ground or, or you're not going to. You're not going to last. Right. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of changed with recent years. Right. Like you've seen, you know, sort of the Russian takeover. I mean, you're fighting a, a, a Russian here uh, on Friday. Right. Like Sambo has been a whole thing. Uh, Habib. Right. We see obviously Salmakashev and we've seen a lot of those guys have tons of success using that martial art. So um, I don't know if you agree um, with that. Like, do you feel like jujitsu has maybe lost a little bit of relevancy? Obviously still very important, but maybe it's not as dominant as it used to be now that we have like Sambo and, and a few other martial arts a little bit more embedded into the sport. I could see people making the case, but what I would also argue is that we're living in a completely different era in terms of communication than we ever have. And what I mean by that is, is during the same period of time that you just described, video on the internet became a much more, uh, a much more big thing than it was when all that started, right? Like the idea of being able to watch, you know, me compete, you know, living in, in, in Russia was, would probably have been difficult in the nineties. You know what I mean? And, uh, uh it certainly, certainly would i would have to have been participating in something that somebody was putting on television you know what i mean and then even if i was putting it putting on television it would have to be on a russian network you know what i mean yeah. and it's like so people are trading in order to get techniques they're trading like vhs tapes you know what i mean yeah. uh, you know from old wrestlers and different things like that you know but nowadays it's like man you know everybody's seeing everything that everybody's doing so all of these martial arts you know that we're talking about and this is why i say like i you know i the labels don't really matter so much to me because people are just going to use what works. You know, Sambo, Jiu Jitsu, uh, submission wrestling, however, however many labels we want to throw at it, you know, like guys are seeing the best in the world compete and they're going to take what works, you know? So we could take a guy like Khabib and be like, Oh, or wrestling and this, that, the other thing. It's like, dude, like Khabib knows how to do Jiu Jitsu. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, he wasn't a Jiu Jitsu a purist. Like the guy didn't go compete, you know, um, you know, professionally, no, <laughs> the guy didn't go compete professionally in jiu-jitsu, but like, make no mistake. I mean, I'm sure that, dude, you know, he knows what he's doing. Obviously he submits people. Yeah. It's like, like the guy uses jiu-jitsu, right? So I think that's a, it's a, it's hard. It's a hard part of the argument because, um, I think that through the intercommunication and, and all of the, all of the, the different athletes that we get to see, you know, on video online on a day-to-day -day basis has made all of these sports blend together a little bit more. Um, maybe than they had in the past. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, we look at something and we label something as wrestling, but it's also like, you know, it's not like the early days of the UFC where, the, where a guy walked out there and like didn't know what a guillotine was. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like there was no point in Khabib's career where he didn't know what a guillotine was. You know what I mean? That's not, that, that wasn't a thing. He didn't know what an arm bar was, right? So, yeah, I think it's a little different. Yeah. So, like, when people have those conversations, like, you know, what's sort of a better base for MMA, like jiu-jitsu or sambo, do you even entertain it? Do you find it stupid just because, like, it's just so hard to parse the two sports? Or or do you feel like maybe there is a better base? Um. Well, you know, for me, in terms of, like, martial arts, I, I always look at, like, I would even dial it back further and just say, like, hey, man, you know, become as athletic as possible. I would be like, yeah, hey, man, you know, get involved with some gymnastics or something. You know, if we're talking, like, you know, chill, you know, children age, you know what I mean? And and other thing is, is like, you know, in terms of like head trauma and things like that, I probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't think that it would be great to have like a ton of head trauma, like super young and these sorts of mm-hmm. things. So you got to be careful with how you parcel that out and how you drill that. So if you're going to start doing the striking martial arts, you got to be super, you have to find a good coach and, and like a good program that's going to do that in a safe way. Right. Um, you know, and then in terms of the grappling martial arts, which, you know, in that way, it's much safer, right? Like we're not going to get, you know, nobody's getting hit in the head really. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I, I would say that at least in the United States, chances are that if you were participating in like a Sambo program, my guess is, is it's probably in the United States, again, in Russia, it's probably much different. Mm -hmm. In the United States, if you're participating in a Sambo program, my guess is a far, it's just like a watered down version yeah. of like a great Jiu Jitsu spot. Like if you went to a great Jiu Jitsu spot that's, that's working all around areas and not, everybody's not just doing like, you know, weird shit with their gi, um, you know, I think that, I think that you're probably going to do better there than you are at like a quote unquote Sambo place or catch wrestling place or like whatever the, like I think what ends up happening is, is these people just want to like make a brand name out of these things and and this is in you know separate themselves in some way and and then they brainwash all their students and you know that's typically kind of the way that that kind of thing works and you know if you were in Russia you know would I tell you like don't start with sambo you got to start with jiu-jitsu probably not because I would say that like there's probably tougher sambo guys right in Russia right so it's like it, it, it's tricky it's very tricky right yeah. You know, the starter pack kit for Sambo is, you know, not to be like all um, generalizing, but your opponent, right? The beard without the mustache, right? The bangs, like the whole thing, right? What's the starter, what, what's the starter pack for jujitsu? Oh, man. Nowadays, you know, it's become a completely different thing than what it used to be. It's funny because in the early days of Nogi Jiu-Jitsu, a lot of people don't know this, you know, because this is before, for the most part, most of this stuff was filmed and shit. You know, the the no gi jiu jitsu kit was basically wearing a fucking banana hammock. You know, like <laughs> like fucking Brazilians would show up shirtless in a fucking banana hammock. I think they called yeah. it a sunga, uh-huh. and uh, and they would they fucking grapple. It probably it probably looked like the weirdest fucking thing ever. Um, but now you know, and then it kind of migrated to like the you know you got a little bit of that California culture, right? So you had like the super long board shorts, yeah. you know, kind of thing, and, and that was like nogi culture, dude. Nowadays, it's like people are, look like fucking Peter Pan, you know? It's like, hey, let's just get the weirdest, most colorful tights that I can fucking find, uh, and uh, you know that's what I'm gonna grapple in. So that's it's like the jujitsu kit, you know, nowadays. Um, I I'm not quite uh, I'm not quite I'm somewhere in the middle, you know, not definitely not wearing the, you know, the banana hammock, that's for sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, maybe a little, little higher cut shorts. I've never, I hate long sleeve rash guards and spats. It, they're awful. It, I, I feel like I'm being slowly strangled by my own clothes. Yeah. It's like, dude, we, we got out of the gi for a reason. Why am I fully clothed again? What's, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I forgot another thing. If your last name ends on OV of, right? Like you, that's, uh, that's gotta be added to the, to the Sambo starter pack kit. Um, but yeah, man, um, (laughs) another thing that I wanted to ask you, um, was that I I remember when I first started interviewing you, there was sort of this like new crop of black belts, right? Right. That all switched to MMA or all had aspirations to go into MMA and you guys were all competing against each other. Um, and that was, and, and let me know if I'm missing anybody, but it was you, Kron Gracie, 
Um, AJ Agazarm, uh, Dylan Dennis. Am I missing somebody else? Um, I would say, yeah, from our era, you know, from the guys that I was competing against. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty, you pretty much caught it. I think Ryan Hall was a little bit earlier than us. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, his he had a different era of jiu-jitsu and he had started doing MMA a bit earlier, you know, than us. But yeah, right. that's the only other person I can think of to maybe add to the conversation, but it's not quite the same group. Um, Kron has had, you know, a successful career, right? He's been like a bit limited in the UFC, has had some setbacks, but, you know, made it to the UFC, has gotten some good victories there. Um, AJ didn't really go full into the whole MMA thing. I, I think he just had maybe like one fight and, or something like that. Um, and I don't know what he's doing now. Uh, but perhaps like the, the wildest story is, is been Dylan Dennis, right? Like he went in there with a lot of promise into MMA. I know you, you, you've competed with him quite a ton. He was Conor McGregor's training partner. He got a bunch of, you know, fame because of that competed in Bellator twice won both of his fights and then kind of just he I don't want to say disappeared because he definitely didn't disappear he's kind of just trolling <laughs> online we wish. we've seen videos we of him getting choked out by like a bouncer um and then he's kind of like getting um you know to be honest just keeping it 100 here he's getting ridiculed by a bunch of people online like he's kind of like a joke yeah. now um and to me it was very right. sad because I, I genuinely thought that you know he had some promise like he was you know a good grappler yeah and uh, if taking his career, like, seriously, in my opinion, like, I, I think, I'm not saying he would have been, like, you know, one of the greatest of all time or anything like that, but I did think that he's uh, kind of um, underachieving, right? Uh, and I don't even yeah. know if he's going to ever fight again. Um, last time we heard he was going to fight, like, a YouTuber in boxing, and then he didn't even train for that, and that didn't come through. So I'm not here to ask you to, like, talk shit about him, but just, like... Was it crazy? Like you, all you guys going into MMA, like, did you expect his career to go the way that it did? Because it's certainly been like very bizarre. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll, I'll answer this question. I'll entertain it just because I like you, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to do Dylan Danis any favors. If my advice to the whole world would be that if any of you no longer want to participate in this circus, just stop talking about the guy. <laughs> and I know he makes it hard because of the, of the crazy shit that he says and does. And, and, you know, it's so cringy and all these sorts of things. But, like, I mean, we every, every single conversation we have brings life to this, you know, this monster. So, anyway, um, yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, uh, the things, things that you said, I, I find a lot of them to be true. I thought he was very talented as well uh, in grappling. I think he was good, you know. Um, and like you said, it, being – uh, involved with Conor McGregor, you would imagine that that would have uh, he would have been able to parlay that into having a decent amount of resources uh, to get good in MMA if that's what he desired to do. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know what his. I'm not. I've never been close with him, really. You know, we we always have kind of been on uh, at odds with one another for most of our careers. So uh, I don't know what his true ambitions were you know, for competition in mixed martial art or jujitsu or whatever the case may be. It's hard for me to say, but for there's no doubt, like you said, that the guy had some talent and he had access to, you know, potentially decent coaching. Um, so for, I, I, don't, I don't think it would be a crazy thing to say he didn't meet at, at, at the very least what most people would imagine his potential to be. You know, we'll see what happens. I mean, he's still not, you know, like crazy old or anything. It's like he's got time if he wants, decides he wants to get back in there or whatever the case may be. It's starting to seem to me like that's he decided and realized that that's not really what he's interested in. And start, it, real, it, it seems to me that what he realizes is like, you know, it's a lot more fun to just be, you know, in the conversation than it is to actually participate in the thing. You know, like fighting sucks, dude. It's tough. It's really hard. Like it's hard to train. It's hard to go out there and actually do it. You know, like I'm sweating bullets, you know, all the time. And every day of this fight week, you know, uh, or even, you know, before that, you know, I have my little moments of anxiety where I'm thinking, fuck, dude, I'm going to get in front of a bunch of people and, and have to throw fists in a cage. Like, this is nuts. Dude, I, I get it. You know, that's that's not for everybody. And uh, I think he realizes it's, it's not, even though he did succeed in, in some of his fights, it's just, I think he realized it's not what he even wants to do. Um, and it's more fun to just kind of like sit back and, and, uh, you know, uh, bank off like the fame that he's already collected and, and have some fun. And, you know, that's what he seems like he's, that's what he seems like he's doing to me, you know, but yeah, I would agree with you in most of what you said. Yeah. 
And by the way, I don't give any air to that whole thing. Like, I don't respond. I don't, I don't, I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, how is he saying this on Twitter? I don't get into any of that. I just thought like you'd be relevant to the conversation because right. I do think that like, you know, um, yeah. sort of his persona and, and, and whatnot aside, I, I thought he was, you know, he was a good grappler, right? Like, and like, uh, as I mentioned, like the, there was that crop of you guys that we were all kind of excited. Like, okay, these are like the young jujitsu guys that are killing it. And, uh, you know, let's see what they can do in right. MMA. And certainly I feel like you've probably been the, the best out of that, that group. But, uh, but certainly his career has, has been so bizarre because it just feels like, again, with the whole Conor McGregor thing, he could have leveraged that into like, you know, I don't know, something bigger, but right. I don't know, to each their own. Right. Right. So, Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And, and, you know, the part of the reason I entertained the question, I thought, I thought you asked a very genuine question about him too. We're not just bringing him up for no reason. Like I think that, that, you know, it's relevant. And, uh, and I also think, you know, uh, I'll toot my own horn, whatever, uh, you know, you did it for me too. So, um, I, I do believe that I, I was the best out of, uh, you know, my group, you know, to, as far as success and mixed martial arts is concerned. And I think I will continue to be, and I don't, I don't think any of those guys are going to touch uh, what I'm going to do in mixed martial arts. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've fought for a major championship belt. That's something that, uh, none of those guys can say. So, um, yeah, certainly, uh, yeah. agree with that one. I'll back that claim too. Um, and, uh, lastly, uh, <laughs> to end here, and I know you got to go to sleep. I appreciate your time. I'm, I've been really enjoying this, okay, this conversation, that. man. I got to ask you about Zuckerberg. Uh, what do you make of him training? Right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still kind of in awe. Like, is it's like, you know, I see him in, in, in the rash guards and whatnot. And I'm like, is he really taking it seriously? Right. Then he takes a photo with Israel Asanya and Volk and he's shredded. Like you can tell he's, he's putting in the time on the mat. Um, first of all, have you sure. met the guy at all? Does he follow you? Cause I know he's like pretty into the MMA and BJJ community now. And if he does, I didn't notice and I apologize, but <laughs> you know, cause that kind of feels like I should have noticed. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I know he uh, has been, had communication with Gordon. I know, uh, I, you know, I've seen him like, uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast, mm -hmm. right. To, um, so, you know, first off, no, as far as like me having contact with him, you know, I don't, I haven't conversed with him. I haven't, I haven't ever met him. Um, but what I will say is, you know, when I had first heard him talking about doing mixed martial arts and jujitsu and stuff on Joe Rogan, I was really excited, man. You know, um, because even just looking at like what Joe Rogan has done by bringing light to our sport and everything like that. And, you know, obviously he's a, uh, now, now who Joe Rogan is, is very different than you know, who he was when he first started talking about jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts, right? So he kind of grew into, you know, one of the biggest, you know, um, I guess, like, new forms of media, you know, that exist, right? But, um, you know, a guy like Zuckerberg's obviously, you know, got a lot of eyes on him, a lot of ears on him. People are paying attention to what he's doing. Crazy, crazy, incredibly successful guy. Um, so for him to be talking about our sport is just big. You know, it, yeah. it, it's... One of the things I hate I about some positive thing, right? One yeah. of the things I hate about sometimes people in our sport um, doing is like you know a celebrity will get involved. I think like Demi Lovato started training once, yeah. and and I think uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other people that got involved. Um, he uh, there's another one too that he was actually on Joe's podcast. The English guy Russell Brand, he's really funny. Russell Brand, I love him in Marshall. Okay. But uh, yeah, you know they they talk shit about some of these guys. You know, get involved in in jujitsu, and you know they'll get like a belt promotion, and everybody talks shit. It's just like Jesus, guys. Like we got a good thing going here. We got momentum. This is only gonna help. Like this is gonna help all these jujitsu athletes that you love make money. This is going to help the whole sport be more successful, you know, all these sorts of things. It's like, it's like, man, we're making it and you guys are trying to ruin it. It's <laughs> just, just let it be, man. I'm not saying that these guys don't deserve, you know, uh, you know, some shit talk where shit talk is due. Like, you know, when people make mistakes and people do things, you know, I, I'll be the first to tell you that like, I'm not, uh, I'm not totally cool with, uh, you know, all the things that, uh, social media has been, uh, has been doing, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, censorship and, uh, and uh, what I believe to be like a mass manipulation uh, of uh, of human beings. I don't even want to say the American people. I just think of human beings, period. Um, I, I definitely think that some problems need to be solved. So, that, you know, I'll throw criticism that way. I'm not saying that you can't criticize these people, but I'm saying in the context of them doing mixed martial arts and jujitsu, like we should be stoked. We should all be happy. Like, that's great. You know what I mean? Um, that, that these big, big names and these super successful people are, are interested. And it just goes to show you 
you know, again, it, it's just such a great representation for people that like, man, if somebody like that can get something out of this, you know, if somebody like Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or like whoever these guys, you know, are, they can get something out of jujitsu and mixed martial arts and it, it's meaningful to them. I mean, hell man, you know, it's, it, it could do something for anybody because I mean, these guys have presumably, at least from most people's perspective, whatever the hell they want. You know what I mean? They're the most, the richest, most powerful men in the world. If you know, if they don't ever have to get punched in the face, they don't ever have to grapple. They don't have to, so if that's meaningful to these people, man, we must really have something going on. You know, this really, there really must be something to this, uh, this thing. Otherwise, why the hell are they doing it? You know what I mean? What's the yeah, point? For sure. Yeah. MMA sucks. I don't get punched in the face, but I've grappled and yeah, Jiu Jitsu <laughs> sucks as well, man. So definitely if you're doing right, it, like right. you're, you're, you're loving it, right? It's like, there's no, no, no other way around sure. it. All right, Gary. Well, I appreciate this conversation. Thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the time to chat, you know, 40 plus minutes with me. I know you got to go to sleep. Uh, it's probably late out, out there. So, uh, thank you so much for the time. And again, best of luck on this return. Uh, one fighting, I'm sorry, one fight night, 12 this Friday. Gary Tonin's return, Gary Tonin's uh, continuous campaign back to the title reign. So make sure you, to tune that in. Uh, and thank you, Gary, once again, and best of luck this Friday. Thanks for the opportunity. Love to talk to you, man.